you much. We're going to start the uh, regular meeting of the Budget and Finance no. Committee. Uh, we have a quorum, Mr. Rosenthal, <laughs> Mr. Smith, Mr. Weezor, myself, Bernard Parks as the chair. Uh, we have two items that are on the closed session agenda, which is one and two. Colleagues, if we could go through the consent calendar. Uh, in several of these, we have a request for some minor added information to the committee report, but like to put consent items four, five, six, seven, nine, and 13. Now, let me ask you, is 11 and 12 still being asked for continuances? Uh, yes. By the mayor's office? Continuances. Okay, if the mayor's office asks for us to continue items 11 and 12. So, if Mr. we chair, with number six, I'd like to ask some questions on okay, that. Okay, well, let's hold that. We'll hold that for regular then. Okay, so if we can have uh, four, five, seven, nine, and 13. Wait a minute, four, five, seven, nine, and 13. 13. Okay, yeah. Great. Let's continue the 11 and 12. On item four, what I'd like is we approve the finance committee report recommendations but also that in the committee report it should specifically state that the uh, 783,000 overpayment even though it's out of statute would be credited to the company's future tax liabilities rather than may that we've asked that that be a process that they get their money back uh, the item on number five is that uh, we just like a re uh, prove the treasurer's recommendations but also would like it's uh, at some point in the near future to get the city clerk's report back on how they've expanded the uh, distribution of notifications uh, in the major newspapers. We asked that, I think, uh, recently on another report. Just like to get that report back on how well those reports are being, or those re achievement, uh, public uh, notices are being published uh, other than just the Daily Journal. Uh, number six. Uh, <coughs> We'll, we'll hold number seven that uh, we'll approve the CAO's recommendations, but uh, would like to add in the committee report just for clarity, what were the circumstances of the five cases that are listed in recommendation number three? And also, uh, if we could have uh, also in the committee report and ask the City, the CAO to get with the, the committee clerk uh, and basically um, give us additional information of the current status of the uh, Mayday claims just for our general information. Okay, we, we actually do have a amendment to our recommendation 3A um, that 600,000 should be increased to 700,000. Where, where okay. That's, that's a number uh, seven. On seven, that's recommendation 3A. 3A, that's on the five reports. None of those, if my understanding, are Mayday cases? No. Okay, we just need a little line that tells us what kind of, what's the circumstance. A little more detail. Okay, now if you move uh, 3A to 700,000, is that going to be more than what was identified as to uh, the three budget years that have gone uh, unallocated? Uh, well, we had the recommendation to, to disencumber the, the 753, but we do have current year monies that we'll, we can allocate to the contract. And I believe when this item and the motion get to council, we'll have a little discussion on one of these cases. Because okay. now the way the report <coughs> is written is that, th if I understood it, is that uh, thir uh, 3A through E Al, uh, basically alloc reallocates the $753,772 that was uh, basically found in years 01, 02, and 03. So now when you say 700000 we have to amend it. Where, what source of funds are, is that other 100000 coming from? It's in the current year. It's current year monies. Current year? Yes. Okay, so do we have to add an instruction to the report so that it's 100,000 more than what we unallocated? Yes, but well, basically, it's 3A just need to be increased to the 700,000. Okay. That's all we need to have changed. We okay, but again, 
if we move it to 700, it will be over the 753. Well, well that, that was, remember, we do, the 753 was from prior years. We did get, uh, I believe, 2.6 million in this current year budget to deal with a lot of these contracts and cases. So but, we still have we some. we have to put an instruction where that 100,000 is coming from. Well, this is a, just asking for contract authority to increase the contract authority. So that's why we just have to change 3A, that's all. Okay. I'm, maybe I'm missing something. It, but if we change 3A and we've all through the report instructed the controller. Well, well th these are just basically giving us contract authorizations. Okay. All the recommendations in 3A is basically allows us to do amendments to increase the contract. Okay. It, but it, it's, it's, it's sort of separate from the overall, you know, funding issue. That's what he said. Okay, then, so I can understand it. We're asking them to disencumber $753,000. We're then authorizing the CAO to uh, basically encumber those funds into five new accounts. It basically goes back into the ACP fund so we can then make contract amendments, but we have ex some existing funding remaining in ACP that would take care of the additional 100000 Okay. Um, for the burden and tow. So you're telling us that the instruction one is just putting it in the general account. That's is correct. Being dispersed or authorization is in three, is authorizing that account to fulfill these five cases. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay. Just but to do with Mr. Chicken, one question. Anything to do with that closed session we did on May Day? Where is that process now? That hasn't come before the council. No, um, that process will come before the council when this report goes forward as well, because I think there was a discussion on the status of that case and some of the funds that we're expending for that particular case as well. Okay. So you'll give us some lead time when that's going to come on the council? Yes. We need to open that whole thing up in that council. Okay. Okay. And, and also that none of, just assure us, none of these cases, 3A through E, are Mayday cases? No. Okay. Nope. Okay, and if we could just get a thumbnail sketch of what these f five cases are. So, Lorraine, have you gotten all that? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll assist her. All right. So, we will move to, dis, uh, to uh, under these three budget years to uh, disencumber the money. We'll then give authority in 3A through E to give authority for those five contracts. And also with that, uh, we will uh, ask for an amendment to give us a, a sum of thumbnail evaluation of what those three, five cases are. Okay. On number, that was seven. Number nine, uh, both nine and I believe 13, uh, those are new trust funds. Uh, we need to make sure the city, not for approval, but the city clerk has reviewed those before they come to council. Was it was not the new process? The, the city controller. clerk or the city controller? City controller, I'm sorry. Controller, yeah. City controller on both uh, 9 and 13 that they reviewed before coming to city council. Okay. And so we continue 11 and 12. So that should cover the consent calendar of 4, 5, 7, 9, and 13 with those amended instructions. Okay, so we'll go to closed session on items one and two, and we'll come back to regular session for three, six, eight, 10, and 14. Yeah.
and Finance Committee is reconvening. Uh, on just want to make for the record, uh, uh, because we do not have generally committee reports on closed session items, but on item two, for the record, one to, uh, the committee uh, uh, concurs that we ensure that if the property that was discussed is sold, that those funds from that property go into the general fund. Okay, next item. Okay, that takes us to, us to item number three, which is a CLA and city attorney uh, report uh, and citywide ordinance and resolution relative to establishing a community taxing district, uh, amending the Los Angeles Muni Code to provide an option for the parking occupancy tax remittance requirement for any parking operator uh, that has paid special taxes levied by a community taxing district. Let me just say, I, th I think most of us have gone through this, and this to this point. I would just like to make sure that the committee report reflects, in, in, to the best of our ability, eliminate uh, what some of the unfounded rumors are in the sense of how the deal is structured, uh, that it's new revenues produced by the project, not general fund money. Uh, also, that we ensure that we work with the clerk and get the wording as to what safeguards are are, have been included to ensure that if the project does not meet the financial standards that have been set, just what are the fallback positions? Because all of the rumors reflect that the city's general fund is in jeopardy, and I think we need to clarify uh, those kinds of safeguards uh, uh, the, so that we make sure that the uh, general fund is not impacted uh, and that there are safeguards that the project, if it doesn't create the su uh, sufficient funds, uh, how do we continue with the mandated agreement? Those are the very critical points that I'd ask if you could get with the clerk so that we can make sure that it's laid out as to what the deal is and how the general fund is protected, how the new revenues are going to be sorted. Uh, we've identified uh, 60 million in one regard for TOT, 5.5 million for the parking. Uh, if those figures over those years do, are not matched by the project, what is the alternative? Those are the things I think need to be okay. clarified in the committee report because this may, once these ordinances are in place, uh, it's a done deal. Yeah. And I think we just don't want to have more questions unanswered than answered. Yeah. This is all net new revenue. John Wickham with the Office of Chief Legislative Analyst. All net new revenue, if they don't build anything, nothing goes out. Um, this is only from the revenue that they collect. If the hotel is not successful, then they are collecting all of nothing that's not successful. It's just whatever is generated by the hotel okay. and by the parking structure. So, you know, we hope them that they generate terrific amounts of money and that it's very successful. And uh, the one thing I think that has come up before is that even though we've set these safeguards, yes. if say. You know, and, and, and everybody's hopeful that it's going to be made very successful. But if they should basically build something and say uh, it hits something to where the sixty million dollar mark, do they get all of that? There's there's n no recourse to the general fund at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can't come back and and ask yeah. for money I mean, to how, pay. But, but back what's unclear up. is what's the percentage if they only build something and it makes 60 million, do they get all of that over that 20 year period? That's the net new revenue that they would be uh, generating in the hotel that they would be holding on to. Okay. So if it does get to 60.5, then that's the amount. It does not go more than 60.5. Okay. The thing is, is that if they only get to that point, then the city gets nothing. Uh, well, there are other, lots of other revenues that are generated by the project. You yeah. Property tax that. and utility tax and Okay. Yeah. But we need to clarify that because what came out, I think, as these things gone through, there's a lot of misinformation as to yeah. whether the city is uh, basically funding this project or is the general fund impacted. If it is a project that fails and it only reaches a level of success that's minimal, uh, do they get all the money that they create if it's within this $60 million and $5 million plateau? Uh, do they only get a percentage of the money? if they are unsuccessful. Those are the things I think have to be clarified so that we're aware of what the formula might be. They don't get the first 60 million and then we get the rest or that's the questions that are being asked. Okay. Um, the, the, 
the, the tax that they're collecting when they open the door is the amount of money that they would be retaining in the hotel. Um, so there, there's a, there a maximum amount of either 20 years or $60.5 million, whichever is reached first. Okay. If they, um, and so they're holding onto the TOT up to those, those milestones. After that, then the city is, receives the TOT revenues. Okay. So I think if they get the first 60 million. They get the first, e either the first, yeah, either the first 60.5 million or however much TOT they generate in the first 20 years. If they only generate 20 million dollars in the first 20 years, then everything after 20 years comes back to the city. Those are the things I think need to be clarified in the report so that, again, when it goes through, it may be one of the last times with all these ordinances that this issue is dealt with. And I'd hate for it to go to council and there are more questions than answers. So we can clarify. This is um, one form of subsidy for this development. What's the total amount of subsidy that the city's giving, just to keep this in context? The, um, or any other types of mechanisms that are being used like this? Uh, are they coming to us piecemeal, or are we approving This is the, it. This is it. Yeah. I, um, last year, the council um, also approved some items related to the CRA. But this is it. This is the last thing. The council last year instructed us, well, the council approved a memorandum of, of understanding between the city and re the related companies and instructed us to negotiate the final documents to implement the terms in that MOU. So this is simply bringing forward the, um, the implementation document for those MOU terms. And, and what's the total amount of subsidy that we're giving to this project, the city? Um, the the TOT is a maximum of 60.5 or 20 years present value, and the parking tax is uh, five point. We're estimating at 5.5 million. And there's no others that are coming to us. No, this? Okay. this is it. What if we didn't uh, go along with this? What would happen? Uh, they would not. They would have trouble um, completing the financing for the project. Isn't this a new uh, player in this that wasn't there back when? This is the related companies. It's the same company, the same developer. No, I'm talking about the, 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 the money coming in from, uh, from overseas. Uh, that's one of the equity partners. They do have a new equity partner in the project. The, uh, the related company is the li limited liability company, but one of the partners in the limited liability company is the overseas investor. But so the 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 main entity is the same and that's what you see here the county and the redevelopment agency and then ultimately the joint powers authority the grand avenue joint powers authority got to approve that change but the city did not although the fact is is that they're they're now in place so you have actual notice that who they are here but but that and they are now a part of what you approve but we're not directly approving the change. That's happened already. A year ago, when we voted on this in the council, were we clear that there would be this uh, revenue, uh, there would be this 50% of, of both the bed tax and 50% of the parking? Um, what happened? Or is this, is this fleshed out as, as I heard? The, the terms are exactly as presented to the council a year ago. A year ago. Is this revenue sharing agreement necessary to make the project feasible? Just back to that question. Absolutely. Okay. What percentage of the net new housing in this project will be affordable? 20%, uh, I believe. 20%. 20% overall of the phase one of the project. In phase one of the project? Mm -hmm. Is that the only phase that has housing in it? Um, that's the only phase that we're that there are any approvals for at this point and the, um, the there are future phases of the project and if they get to those phases they'll be coming back for additional approvals. And the 20% affordable what's our definition of affordable? Uh, let me see if I can track that down real quick. Um, all right. Since we've only been dealing with the housing, I mean, with the hotel component, I'm trying to track down the information from you from the original reports that were done on this matter. 50% um, or below um, AMI. 50% or below. AMI. Yeah. Okay. So that's is that very low? Is that very low? It's very low. Very low. What is the expected revenue to the general fund once the hotel takes its cut? Oh, uh, let me see. The 
Well, it's a calculation that was done over 20 over a 20 year period because the project is generating not only TOT and parking taxes, generating utility taxes, it's generating property taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the project over 20 years is expected to generate $227.9 million um, net new revenue to the general fund. And the, uh, the parking and the TOT are um, uh, half of that. Um, what if we, um, do we have a sunset on when this 50% would be, you know, 100% to the general treasury from the, is this a 20 year it's deal? It's a 20 year deal. What if, what if things move in an accelerated way? Is there a way which we can get out of it? If they, if they generate 60.5 million in less than 20 years, then we would get, at that point, it, we would start collecting the TOT completely. The parking, um, they get to keep the parking tax for up to 10 years. Yeah. They get to keep the hotel tax for up to 20 years. Yeah. But that up to 10 and up to 20 is based on a formula of cash flow? No, they get to keep everything until they reach, until the end of the specific term, 10 or 20 years, or until they reach a certain maximum. Um, the, the parking is such that the maximum is probably well, the parking tax is projected not to be so great as to ever really reach the maximum, but it is a specific number, and it's over 10 years. The hotel tax is probably is for 20 years or until you reach the maximum, whichever is earlier. So the outside subsidy date is 20 years, and the parking tax is 10 years, no matter how much money is How many yeah, rooms in the hotel? Oh, that's it's uh, 400, no, not 400, it's 200 and, um, 275. Is there any projected revenue on that from the uh, uh, bed tax? Uh, yes. Uh, we had a consultant who, uh, PKF Consulting, who did an analysis of the projected revenues for the project. And um, they came in $47 million in present value. On the on the um, revenue for the TOT over the twenty over the twenty years in present value terms. Present value at what percent? To when you when you project out your net present value is generally two percent three. What is it? Ten percent. Ten. That's high. We went with a very conservative 3% simple interest. No, wait, that's the, uh, yeah, it's 10%. We went with a very conservative approach on this analysis. Uh, we didn't want to overestimate the amount of, of revenue that they were going to generate for the hotel. You use 10% over the 20 years, not a, yeah. not a 3% or 2% annual. No. What normally you do when you do a net present value projection. Okay. Okay, we'll move that item. But again, if we can be sensitive to that clarity in, in the committee report and provide Lorraine with what we need. Okay. Ms. Parks, at this point, I'm going to vote no. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, with, with I, let's see, three to one. Jose, are you voting for this? Yes. Three to one. Okay. Next item. Okay, next item is item number six, which is a city attorney report and ordinance relative to amending sections of the Los Angeles Administrative Code to allow the future proceeds from the sale of fire department facilities to be deposited into the general fund rather than the vacated uh, fire department fund. Okay. And staff. I don't think we have staff here, but as, as you recall, when we, uh, in the mid-year financial status report, we initiated discussion on animal shelters, and the committee came back uh, with possibly including some of the fire department facilities. They do, uh, one of the things that the city attorney uh, notes in their memo is that the way the ordinance was drafted, uh, it refers to all future receipts and sales. It does not take into account any current um, 
receipts and, and so forth. Yeah, and I might say, Mr. Chair, I've yes. spoken with the fire department. Mm -hmm. They've cleared up my questions. It's fine for me to go on. Okay. All right. Let me just ask uh, a couple of things. Is that there's a little different, uh, I think, verbiage from the notes that the CLA is saying basically that we, uh, in addition to uh, approving the ordinance, that we request the city attorney to revise the draft ordinance and amend so that all revenues of rental for from the rentals of all vacant fire stations shall be deposited in the general fund, not the vacated fire department facility fund. Now, in the notes, they say, other than that's required for debt service. Uh, is that something we're going to put in the ordinance or that the CLA is going to work with the city attorney? As I may be able to answer that question, Mr. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, that, that subsection B currently reads that all um, rental from properties purchased for the city for future use as, as fire facilities, that those rentals will go into the fund. Um, the, the, the question is, is that what you want, or do you want all rentals to go into that fire facilities fund? Um, and, and one of the things on, that, and, I, and I, I think this is, um, from our perspective, we would like to see any rental receipts um, purchase would go into the general fund. It would not, it would not only apply to future, but it would also be any current. Right, and I just want you to understand that the removal of future would have all the rentals go into the vacated fire facilities fund. It wouldn't have it go into the general fund. Removal of that. Oh, the word future. Uh, the word yeah. future actually does the opposite. So, so if if you'd like that changed, we need to change it to have all rentals from facilities go to the general fund rather than the the vacated fire facilities fund. If that's what if that's the wish of the of the committee and the council. Well, what do we have uh, in the way of rental facilities now in these I, I, I don't have that information. I know there's I, one I, at Canoga Park. That's all I know. <laughs> I, I suspect that there, there may be one or maybe several that are rented to nonprofits. Yeah. But whatever rentals received yeah. is probably and nominal. Eight, ten, and and so if in the future, if it was just future, if, again, if it's a city use, uh, the money is just transferred then from department to department. To this other fund so if it's another city department that uses it right. and they pay the rent to this fund there, there would be no rental then at the city just simply mixed use of the facility because it's property that's controlled by the council and the city there's no rental charged but we're talking about when they're rented to, to people non-city entities. Non entities okay and in those instances if the property is intended to be used as a fire station in the future, those revenues go, the revenues, the rental revenues go into the fire, vacated fire facilities trust fund right now. And that, that can all be changed so that all rentals go into the vacant, whatever they are, whether it's $100 a month or 10000 rather, well, I'd rather see a list then before we did that on what we're talking about. Um, That's fine. I, it, but to answer your specific question, the code, that, that code section does now provide that first the revenues go to pay any outstanding bonds before they go into the vacated facilities fund or before they would go into the general fund if you change that. That, that point is already addressed in the section, in the current section. So you said the point about the debt service is already yes, covered? Yes, that is addressed there. Okay. So the money goes first to that okay. before it goes anywhere. And that's in the language of the ordinance? In the yeah. current ordinance, yes. Okay. All right. now, now the issue that was unclear is to pro, uh, current stations that are being rented now that they currently go to the vacated fire fund? If, if they're actually stations that are no longer used as stations and are not intended to be used as a fire station, that revenue is, is supposed to be going to the general fund. I don't know where it goes, but it's supposed to be going to the general fund. The current language only addresses the revenue from stations that are intended to be used in the future as fire stations. That rental is going into the vacated facilities fund. So if we're moving forward on another ordinance that talks about these fire stations in the future that are sold go in the general fund, then it's my assumption that we should be cleaning all this up at the same time. And, and we can. If okay. it's the desire of the committee, we need, we need to make some changes to this draft ordinance in any event before it goes to council. One is what date you'd like this to be effective. I'm assuming that if we pick a date like June 1, that would be acceptable so that we're, it's, it's the, the overall effect of the ordinance would then be going forward from June 1. Any receipts from that point on would go into the, uh, into the general fund. As to the rentals, if it's your desire, the committee directs, we can change that so that all rental receipts from 
vacated fire stations or those intended to be used in the future as fire stations will go into the general fund. What, first, what, first to pay the bonds, yeah. and then to the. Do we have an idea what the money's being used for now? That's going into that fund. I mean, yeah. I, we don't know how much it is, but. I, I have. I personally don't have any, any yeah, information. You know, Apparently, I want to make it kind of change. I'd like to know. Yeah. They are restricted, though. I, we're not sure specifically what it's assigned, but they're restricted to capital improvements at fire facilities. Okay. And um, our recommendation um, in the in the uh, to the chair was. In as much as in the mid-year, the council wanted the proceeds from the sale of properties not to go into the vacated fire facilities fund, but into the general fund. Consistent with that intent, we believe that the rental income should also follow along with that. Also, we have the Proposition F funding that's currently used for capital improvements of fire stations. We believe that is a better source of funding for capital improvements of fire stations, and this is a source of funding. Now, I don't argue that point, but I think the fire department would say, well, if it's in this fund and we control it, then we can allocate the money and, uh, rather than coming to the council and begging for it. And if you say no, then we can't fix our fire facilities. Actually, this capital, uh, this also needs council approval. Any expenditures from this? Oh, it does. Those? It always has. Yes. Okay. So <coughs> this in the current fund. From the vacated fire facilities fund. It yeah. required. Okay. The one thing I want to make sure uh, is fire station five, fire station 62, and the animal shelter um, on Missouri and Bundy are not part of this going into the general fund. Am I clear on that or not? I will confirm that for you. There is 175,000 currently in this fund, and we will confirm that none of that funding is for any of those three projects. Okay. I just want to make sure those three um, go the strategy that I'm very interested in doing on affordable housing and homeless housing, and that there isn't any general fund sell of those properties. Well, uh, we'll work with the CLA to figure out what the impact would be. I, I don't know. The okay, specific. as long as those three, the other ones I'm. I don't know the we'll specific. Confirm the fire department told me they were not part of this and this and that and the other. We'll I'm confirm sure if any of these funds are, are programmed for any of your projects, any projects, and provide that information to the council Terrific. before this comes to council. Great. Thank you. And I guess my question is is this, is this ordinance say it always goes into the general fund or that it can go into the general fund or. Because no. It, it, it would say that from the date that's specified, and we're saying June 1 at this point, mm -hmm. forward, all receipts from the sale of vacated fire, facility, fire stations would go into the general fund. Now we're talking also about the rentals from that, and my understanding of the, at least the consensus of the committee that I'm hearing is that all rentals from any fire stations, whether it's vacated or a property that is to be used as a fire station in the near future, any rental from those facilities would go into the general fund as well going forward. And I think I heard being asked if um, to make sure from the fire department that there isn't any other kinds of utilization that they planned on using it for or updating that we'd be using general fund instead of. And right, and I, I personally don't know of any. Um, the it's been suggested that Prop F money is what exists. Once again, this is a prospective ordinance. So, the, like I just mentioned, the current balances in that account are not being touched by this yeah. ordinance. The it current is. balances stay the same. We're yes. just saying in the future, yes. in the future, all rent. Yeah. But for the purposes Correct. of Councilman Rosendahl's question, I just wanted to confirm for the committee what those 175 are programmed for, just for your information. But this is a prospective ordinance. Correct. As it goes moving forward, the sale of vacated. I know I have one on Coldwater um, Canyon um, that is, uh, has not been put up because they're still operating under that and we'll be moving over to visit within the month um, period of time to see exactly. And I know there had been some discussion of it being utilized to offset other kinds of things that are occurring in, in that project area. But we'll, we'll stay in touch before this comes to council. Right. So for capital, for capital improvements, we have sufficient funding in Prop F? I believe so. Um, I will confirm that. There is actually an entire program. There are dozens and dozens of capital projects on, um, besides new projects, there are also um, renovations to existing. Yeah, but there, there's a lot left so, to be done in our yeah, fire department. So that, that money's a eventually going to run out. So can, yeah. can you, when you bring this back, can we have a report on that, please? We can actually share that, the latest program for Proposition F that shows all of the projects currently pending under Proposition F and the remaining balances that are available for programming. Because at some point, the city will need to go out for another bond to continue to upgrade and modernize the fire. And, and so here we're making a deliberate choice to uh, take some, some of that money out, and we just have to see that trade-off in a more transparent way, more obvious way if we get that report. How, how much comes into this fund every year? There's 175 balance, but... Wasn't able to determine that council. I don't recall us ever approving money out of this fund. I've never heard of it before. Yeah. 
So I was just wondering, you said if they wanted to do something out of this fund, we got to approve it. I don't remember ever approving anything out of it. I did recall, I, in checking the council file, there was an advance funding from this fund at one time that was reimbursed, <clears throat> but I don't know what that when? was. <laughs> the, a few years ago. 1947. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and the current ordinance reads that all appropriations must be approved by the council either by ordinance or through the budget process. Okay. So the, the ordinance that you're going to come forward with this draft is going to take care of the sale of future and the rent for future. Correct. Does not touch the existing funds within Correct. the vacant building fund. Correct. Okay. And then the remain. date you're looking for is what you said, June 1st? Uh, yeah, my thought would be June 1 unless you have a different direction. It should be sufficient time. Maybe, maybe July 1? July 1 is a fiscal July year. 1? You may as well stick with the fiscal. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. July 1. Okay. Oh. Now, would you like us to bring the ordinance back here before it goes to committee? I think we could send that before to council. Council? I council? Yeah. I don't okay, so July 1 and all rentals are to go to the general fund, understanding that the first place that all the monies go is to play the bonds or any yeah, indentures. Okay. Right. And you said that's already in the ordinance? That's already in there. Okay. Very good. So we'll move that item with those amendments. Thank you very much. Okay, this takes us to item number eight, which is a motion, parts nine, relative to a transfer of funds to continue the contract with Sierra Systems Group, Incorporated, to complete system enhancements and to provide technical support for the Los Angeles Police Department's training, evaluation, and management systems, teams two, and related matters. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think we, we have read this, uh, but one of the things I just want to make sure that in dealing with, uh, and we're dealing with item eight, right? Is that right? Eight? Yes. Eight. Okay. Yes. Is that we uh, have had a, a history in the city as far as building these systems, and then later we find out that they are proprietary, and then we fund outside agencies for decades to keep building or upgrading the system. We were advised at some point there'd be a transfer of knowledge, and I understand there's been some difficulty in getting to that point. And so the reason, and as you know, I added number four onto this motion, is that before we increase the cap on this system, that we're going to have to be come before us and advise us of the progress and the legitimate efforts for that transfer of knowledge. I, I just don't think we can keep adding dollars to the cap without that assurance that we're eventually going to take over this system and that we're going to manage it in, inside the city of L.A. and hopefully they've not built something that we can't manage. And so that's what the whole purpose of making sure that as we move forward that that issue of knowledge transfer is as important to myself as, as well as getting the system built. And so we know that we've been told several times it's going to happen. It just hasn't happened. Right. Um, we did take particular note of that particular instruction uh, in the motion, and the, the police department and ITA have already, <clears throat> excuse me, begun um, developing a new uh, position description uh, to ensure that there is um, an appropriate job class to facilitate uh, knowledge transfer. The personnel department has been alerted. Uh, to the possibility that a new class uh, will be requested to be created, either that uh, or um, they could evaluate the duties and responsibilities and determine whether or not um, um, it could be incorporated within an existing job class. Um, in addition, um, what I've begun recently is to uh, discuss with the police department and ITA what the composition of the job classes are. Um, and also work with the personnel department to evaluate whether or not um, there should be a different mix of job classes um, that would better serve uh, the project and to further facilitate the knowledge transfer. Let me ask, is the difficulty in the fact that the technology has a certain programming that is not universally known amongst programmers? What has been the difficulty? I think uh, Maggie and uh, Campton can respond to that. It's definitely not unique. It's uh, just 
a different level. Um, we're asking for expertise that we're sitting there competing with the outside industry with right now. So we've had occasions where we've made offers and it turned out that they got grabbed by industry. Mm -hmm. I know, but we, how, have we done that routinely or is that one shot deal or? No, the particular technology we have right now is standard. We're, we're looking for things that the whole world has, but the whole world is competing with this also. Because the thing is, is that our alternative is that periodically you're going to come in and say add another couple of million to this contract so they can keep working for us. And I think we've, we've made it clear as we've gone through this that at some point we don't want to keep be, uh, paying this vendor that, we, that they end up being our, our employees. At some point we have to take it over. It's less expensive if we take it over. Uh, the next thing you know, they're going to come in and recommend to us, let's revamp the system and start all over again. And then away we go again. So we, we need to seriously look at that one point uh, uh, in the sense it's just a cost saving overall to the city. And if there's some difficulties in finding people, we need to know about that. If there's a difficulty in identifying the level of expertise, we need to know all that. But we, I just don't want to approve another increase of the cap without some assurances that we made a great deal of effort in finding the people internally to do this. I completely agree, mm -hmm. Council Member. Um, one of the first things I did when I came on just a little over a year ago now, a year and a half ago, um, was, was to start analyzing and, and taking a look at how we can um, accelerate that knowledge transfer. And actually, um, the what we have done over the last year really is um, quite a bit of knowledge transfer. Uh, if you'll recall, last year I was actually here asking for a contract amendment on behalf of Bearing Point as well. Uh, um, we had two contractors involved in Teams 2. Last year we needed four FTE equivalents for Bearing Point. This year I'm not asking for a Bearing Point amendment at all. And in fact, they're, they'll be done with their work in a couple months. And we will uh, support that system, the complaint management system, completely with city staff. So that's four contract staff that we've been able to eliminate over the last year. Um, on the Sierra side, last year I was asking for an increase in order to support um, a, a approximately 11 and a half FTE equivalents for Sierra to support the use of force and RMIS systems. And this year um, I'm dropping that down to about seven FTE equivalents. So uh, I am pushing the city staff very hard to uh, to pick up these skills to um, you know make sure we're getting the proper tr training from the uh, the contractors and make sure that they know that the, the we're not considering them to be a permanent part of our staff and that the goal is to, to transfer the these skills to city staff and I think adding the um, the the fourth point to the motion actually is a great idea because that is one area where we were struggling to identify appropriate city city staff that exist today to take on some of those um, configuration management tasks that are much more technical. They deal with hardware and servers and things like that. Um, so I think coming up with that that job class appropriate for those skills it will um, will really help us. Okay. Let me just ask: when if this was we had the knowledge transfer, ideally, what would then be the relationship with the vendor? I think we might um, enter into some sort of agreement for uh, a sort of maintenance. We'd have to determine what would be best at that point, see where we're at. But assuming uh, a year from now we could be at the point where we're no longer doing enhancements, and I think we can get there, and it's just a matter of man maintaining the system, then I think we could enter into a much smaller maintenance agreement and no longer need a, a staff of developers from the um, contract side. Have we looked at where we are in the sense of down the road where this system will have to start revamping it and rebuilding it? Is that? Yes. And the good thing is, is it was built on all um, very current technology. Um, it was built on an Oracle database, which is the city standard, and none of it will have to be uh, revamped. We can upgrade it on the fly. We don't Correct. have to start all over. Correct. Okay. And then. Um, is there any issues dealing with the vendor as to ownership of data, or is it all no, the cities? No, it, it's all the cities. Okay. No. Okay. Thank you very much. If we can just, we'll move that item, but we really want to emphasize that item four uh, to make sure that we make that progress uh, before we start adding more money to the cap. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item number 10 is a motion parks Weezar relative to development of doc documents 
necessary for the city to issue bonds not to exceed $604 million to refund the 2001 and 2006 variable rate wastewater bonds to be enhanced by letter of credit through Scotiabank and Bank of America. And Sarai is here to yeah. give a report. Good afternoon. Why don't you just give us an overview, because I understand this is different than the other bond issues of, uh, in the sense of been on the news about the uh, insurance and things like that, but give us an idea of what the impact is and what the issues are in this variable bond. Variable bond. Okay, starting around late last year, uh, the bond market experienced volatility related to uh, municipal insurance companies that were tied to um, underwriting some structured products that were backed by residential mortgages. In the last couple of months, they started being downgraded by the major rating agencies. Our variable rate bonds require insurance or some form of security. And for the wastewater bonds, we have insurance provided by FIGIC and XLCA. Um, as those insurance companies are downgraded, our remarketing agents have trouble selling our bonds. So to make them more attractive, they have to offer increased rates. So we've been paying increased rates on, on the wastewater bonds um, to the tune of about $1.3 million in the last year, if you compare it to the same time last year. Um, we looked into canceling the insurance policies, but the bond documents require that we have insurer consent, and we were unable to secure consent from FIGIC or from Excel. Uh, so we looked into other options. Um, the most feasible option at this point is attempting to get a letter of credit, um, which would require that we refund the bonds and we basically come up with a new financing package. Um, we issued an RFP, and we only received three responses, so we commenced just preliminary negotiations with the two lowest bidders, uh, which was Bank of Nova Scotia and uh, Bank of America. So we have prelim preliminarily negotiated with them um, letters of credit in two parts, so we would need to, uh, that is why part of the recommendation is to issue commercial paper. We didn't get responses to provide sufficient capacity to refund the full amount that we needed to refund. And, and let me just ask, the companies that were involved with the insurance, Fidget and the other one you mentioned? XLCA. They're, okay, they're not involved in any way on the letters of credit? No. Okay. The other issue is, is that th when we uh, moved to uh, this direction of letter of credit, letter of credit, is this something that went through our financial advisor or our bench that we've Oh, definitely. We worked with our financial advisors to look at all the options. Okay. Uh, this would, is the most feasible um, and financially opportune type arrangement that we could come up with. Um, it, municipal insu issuers across the country are facing the same problem that we are, and the banks that are in the business of offering letters of credit are inundated by business, by by other issuers trying to secure this kind of a, an arrangement. So we needed to act quickly, and this was on the advice of our financial advisors. Okay, is that through multiple or just one of our advisors? At, at just one. We have one financial advisor that's been working with us on wastewater. Okay, and then let me ask you, on, in the sense of the uh, letter of credit, is there a cost attached to obtaining a letter of credit? Yes. There is an annual cost of 55 basis points, which translates to about um, $1.4 million annually for the letter of credit to be provided by Nova Scotia and $1.1 million for the letter to be provided by Bank of America. Okay, and then how much is that different from what we were paying for insurance on, on our bonds? For the Series 2001, we paid about $2 million for that insurance policy, the one-time payment. And for 2006, we paid, I think it was about 800000 800, for that policy. It was just a few hundred thousand difference for the letter of credit? I'm sorry? It's just a few hundred thousand different for the letter of credit? Yes. Okay, and then how long will the letter of credit be in play? Two years. Two years. The other cost you gave me for the insurance was for what, one year? That was for the life of the bonds. For the life of the bonds. Right. Okay. So, and then, oh, go ahead. I'm saying, so in two years we're going to have to come back and revisit this issue of 
the, the not the insurance, but the well, we will have the option to extend. extend. So depending on where the market is at that point, we'll have to look at it to see if if that's is that's the best. So this will be an ongoing cost over the life of the bonds, and still yes, uh, we'll have to revisit every couple of years. Yes. My question is similar to that. Was this change in the cost of borrowing notice throughout a standard process where we brought into the loop? Are there now systems in place to ensure that we can catch opportunities to reduce debt bond costs like this one in the future? I would say that this situation is unprecedented, and so there was a need, like I mentioned earlier, to react very quickly in order to secure that we had options to look at. So we've come forward as soon as we had options to present. Um, it's been a very fluid process in that the changes to the ratings and, and, and what has been going on to our bonds has been really accelerating the last probably six weeks. Six weeks. But over the last year, has it been noticeable in any way? No. No. It's, it's, this has really been accelerating the last six weeks, but it started when the um, municipal bond insurers started reporting these large losses tied to their subprime market subprime mortgage market is this uh, the tip of an iceberg with us do we have others that potentially are in the chute that we need to focus on right away uh, we do have variable rate debt issued on the convention center but that insurance policy is provided by AMBAC and they are in a better position so we haven't seen the fluctuations in the insurance the uh, interest rates that we're paying for those so at this point it, it doesn't make sense for us to look into um, trying to do a refunding for the convention center bonds are there other bonds besides the convention center? No. Uh, Natalie Brill, CAO. The documents do provide for administrative um, authority to do certain things. The problem was that when we tried to do those things, the insurance wouldn't let us. We're allowed to roll into certain types of documents, to, like the letter of credit, whatever. But right. because the insurance companies they're not there. I mean, they're basically living out of boxes right now. They're not even in L.A. anymore. They would not talk to us at all. So we had no other option except to do the refunding. We were just going to roll into the letter of credit. Very easy. Just roll into it, you know, sign a document like, the docu like you allowed us to do to deal with this. But they would not talk to us. They would not answer phone calls. They would not because they're in trouble. Are we paying them anything? These not days? anymore. Thanks. Okay. Let me just ask also, uh, we, these are variables, and, and they're the, basically the emergency because of the potential increase in cost. Are we considering something down the road on fixed rate bonds, or is that another process? Is that in the mix as far as discussion? Well, the wastewater bonds would be a little bit more complicated because the Series 2006 bonds are tied to a swap. So in order to exit from the swap agreements, we would have to make a one-time payment to our counterparties. And at this point, it's about $7 million. Okay. So th they, th those are being considered down the road. The variables are the critical from time and also cost. Yes, okay. because those rates are reset every week. So we're subject to the changing market in a more real-time way. And tell us again what we could save as it relates to the city and going through this process. Um, over the course of the, the, the remainder of the life of the bonds, we would save approximately uh, $22 million. We save over the life of the bonds? Over the life of the two bonds. Mm -hmm. And these are and into one. the right terminology, they're being reissued? Yes. Okay. And then the other issue I'm, I may have misstated my early question is that are there, are there when I said are the same insurance companies, but what about the underwriters? Are they the same underwriters? on the reissue that issued the initial bonds? Yes, we're proposing to use the same remarketing agents, the same underwriters, mm -hmm. in approximately the same proportion as to what they have in the two are, prior Are these underwriters the ones that we recently have on our underwriting bench that we just went to RFP, or these are just because they were involved in the last project? Are they are the, are the, the first issuance? We selected them because they were part of the first issuance? They were selected because they were part of the 2001 and 2006 okay. series. So, so did they, are they part of our process that we're going through for consideration? Yes. All of those remarketing agents are currently on, in the process of being reviewed as part of the RFP. Okay. Let me just ask on the sense of RFP, did, uh, is that something that because of this issue that 
we quickly went out or did that come through council or is that just an internal process to get to that point? I think it was the timing, it was just the timing of it where this situation became sort of an emergency situation because we were spending so much in interest and then we, we could see that the problem was escalating. The RFP process has sort of been following its own its own pace. When we went out to RFP, were we concerned only getting three responses or, or did we feel comfortable with the outreach? We contacted 18 banks and only received responses from three. One who um, intentionally submitted a very high bid because they were overwhelmed with business so they knew they couldn't take on the business. Um, but then we were able to get uh, proposals from one bank that uh, is already involved with one of the one of the series and Bank of America which is a city's bank. Okay. And then let me just ask for uh, if you could provide the clerk for the committee report uh, just a summary of the analysis that you've given us as to why this proposal saves us money and that we're aware of it so the committee report will contain that and then could we get also an instruction to the CAO to report back to us uh, within six months to tell us what the outcome of this change has been and where we are as relates to saving that money did we reach our goal and so if we can just make sure that you get the, the verbal information so the clerk will have your analysis in the committee report. Okay. One of the things that we've noticed over the last four weeks has been that um, variable rate debt has dropped and we've noticed this because we have other variable rate debt we have commercial paper and that's been about 1.8%. On the fixed rate side, we haven't seen that same drop. We've still at about 4.2, 4.5. Um, and we think that will continue as the Federal Reserve continues to drop rates. So the difference in fixed rate and variable rate is, is big now. It's, it's a very big spread between the two. So that's why when you asked about fixed rate, why we didn't recommend it, that's why. We still get quite a bit of savings from the variable rate debt. With the letter of credit, our interest rate will drop substantially, and we'll see that. And that's really the impetus. And like Sarai said, on Convention Center, we're not seeing that. You know, we had a, bit, a spike for a couple weeks, but it's come back down again. You know, in two weeks, they could be downgraded also. We might be right back here again talking to you about Convention Center. The, nobody seems to know when this will end. Nobody seems to know what the solution is. There have been a lot of hearings at the federal level with the Securities and Exchange Commission and, and, you know, Barry Frank's committee on finance. But nobody seems to know the answer until, really, the Securities and Exchange Commission takes an action with the rating agencies and the bond insurers. We're just, it's a perfect storm, unfortunately, and we're stuck in the middle. Um, you know, the city of New York went out with 20% bonds and they couldn't even sell them, tax exempt. Nobody was buying them. Um, and that's one of the questions that we've been asking, you know, the underwriters. What's going on? Nobody has an answer. A lot of the underwriters have, you know, are gone that we've been dealing with because the market is shrinking. So as soon as we know something, on Convention Center, we'll keep you posted. But it's from basically we're watching those rates from week to week to make sure that we're not detrimental to, to the program. Because, it, you know, Convention Center is general fund. So that one is the one we've been watching like a hawk. And when we're done with wastewater, with this one crisis, we'll move on to convention center. And maybe we do need to move to letter of credit. But we're trying to get through this first, um, where the real crisis is before we move on to AMBAC. AMBAC looks like it's starting to get additional funding from other sources, so that insurance company seems to be OK. And in the future, we're going to be, like every other agency, a lot more critical of those insurance companies. Um, when we come forward with other insurance, with, with other um, bonds, it's going to be a tough sell for us to, to get insurance, and we understand that. Could you report back at some point about this particular insurance a company not returning phone calls and all that and give us on the record a better picture okay. of what happened? We'll get that insurance. from the financial advisors. They've been, they've been trying to reach them, and we've been... Yeah, we'd like that. And also, if okay. something seems to be happening with the other... With Please convention let center? Chair, no, yeah, okay. so that we can have an emergency budget committee because we're going into the budget process next. We'll definitely keep you posted on, on what's been going on. You know, like I said, it's just been an incredible, perfect storm. It's, it's incredible how bad this is. And we thought variable rate debt was fine because we have insurance and we have liquidity. And, you know, in two weeks, everything changed. 
Thank you very much. We'll move that item uh, with those uh, request amendments uh, to that report. Next item. Okay, this takes us to item number 14. <coughs> Bless you. Question. Uh, which is a city attorney and a CAO report uh, relative to the retention of outside legal accounts to assist in pursuing the collection of delinquent business tax accounts. Bless you. The city attorney is asking uh, to enter into contractual agreements with three law firms uh, who will serve as a sort of outside counsel uh, to assist the city attorney's office in, in, following, in following upon these claims. And Ida is here from our office to provide additional detail. Let me just ask, uh, is that pretty standard, uh, industry standard, the percentages that you're proposing, the 20 percent, the 30 percent, 33 percent, 40 percent? The department can respond to that question. Good afternoon, Councilmember okay. Parks. I'm Noreen Vincent from the City Attorney's Office. Um, and uh, Beverly Cook is to my right, and I just see and you're, you're joined by and Anne Haley. Anne Haley. Um, if I may just um, comment, when we um, realized we were going to have to go out and uh, utilize outside counsel to assist us with the 400 cases that we have uh, filed, we issued an RFQ, and in that RFQ we asked pro uh, law firms to come back to us with what they would charge to do this. Most of the law firms actually came back and wanted to be paid on the basis of an hourly rate which um, we really were trying to avoid that. There were only two firms which gave us the option of doing it on a contingency fee and another firm that was willing to do that. So we were able to basically move from uh, a position where they were wanting to charge us an hourly rate to a place where we have three firms who are willing to perform this work for us on a contingency fee basis. Um, in terms of the specific rates that you have in front of you, I believe it ranges from 20 percent up to 40 percent if they actually go through trial. My understanding that that is a pretty standard rate, but I will defer to Ann Haley, uh, who was uh, involved in actually negotiating these rates for us. And, and actually, with regard to that, the, the 20 percent rate is actually, I would say, better than the standard. That, that 33 percent is usually what you see. Um, in terms of contingency rates, so we think that the ability to have negotiated a lower rate for um, those matters that might resolve earlier is of great advantage to the city. And, it, and it's our expectation that all of our cases will get to this process before the statute. Is that not um, actually, um, Council Member? Um, we were able to file all of those cases before the statute of limitations okay. ran. The statute of limitations ran at the end of February, the 1st of March. We received the cases uh, somewhere between the mid-January mid uh, through mid-February, and our staff worked um, diligently to file each and every one of those cases. So we have not lost the statute of limitations. Where we are now, however, is that once you file the cases, the court gives you 60 days from the date you filed to actually serve those cases. So what we need to do now is to move very quickly to serve the cases that we filed and to pursue um, whatever needs to be done in order to collect the revenue. Okay. But now, if you file them, what are we going to ask these three attorney firms to do? What, what are they specifically going to do for this contingency? What, what they would do basically is we would um, refer the cases to the, the firms. We would um, look at an equitable way of dividing up the 400 cases, referring them to the firms, and then they would essentially take those cases and do whatever needed to be done, enter into settlement discussions, um, conduct discovery if necessary, go through mediation if that's what it would take, or in the event that the, uh, the, the taxpayer was not forthcoming with payment at that point, then actually take the case to trial. And then uh, once a recovery uh, is, is had, then they would actually uh, pursue that judgment to a recovery. So the issue is you stayed the statute by filing. Yes, they we, then work, we They basically did. worked the case. I'm, I'm sorry? They, they basically are working the case. To they would have to work the case. That's right. We preserve the statute, so we have uh, the ability to proceed. The, the only thing I, I thought was a little strange in the, in the breakdown, and I don't know if people can manipulate it, but the last one where we talk about uh, they can get about a 7% jump in contingency fees if they settle or resolve it within 10 days of the court hearing. And if you look at C where it talks about mediation, uh, you just don't know if it can be manipulated to where you let allow them to progress to, the, to that period after mediation and then settle them to get 6 or 7% more 
of the contingency. And I'm just, I don't know if there's a safeguard for it. Well, I think the, the safeguard would be that um, even though these cases are referred out, our office, city attorney's office, still has responsibility for supervising the outside counsel. Okay. So we would be looking to supervise and make sure that right. the, the cases is, are properly managed. Didn't want to, all of a sudden, we end up with. Uh, Everything folks. winds up going Just to mediation. Court, we settled it, and, it's, and they get the max amount. That's right. Absolutely. And how did we handle these cases before? Um, we have had um, attorneys, and, and I would also like to say that we continue to have. These are just the 400 which which came to us in sort of a, a large mass uh, referral where we had to file. The Office of Finance has um, been able to increase its, I guess, identification of uh, companies that haven't paid. They have a new tax system, and they were able to identify a number uh, this last year that they weren't able to identify in previous years. We, we still, however, have an ongoing caseload that we manage from the Office of Finance. So the, the ongoing cases are still cases that we have. Um, our attorneys have filed. In addition to the larger cases, um, we're involved in the um, TOT case. We've been involved in the utility users tax cases. So we, we still have a lot of work that we're doing within our office. These are just the cases that are well in excess of what we can handle internally. There are only two attorneys, I'm sorry, two city attorneys who handle these. Right. And did you do a cutoff based on amount or how in, did it, you pick those 400? Actually, these were the cases that the Office of Finance, and Beverly, please step in whenever. Um, the Office of Finance actually had these cases that they had referred out to collection agencies. They have a number of collection agencies on contract, and those companies do whatever they can to collect short of legal, uh, pursuing them legally. Those are not legal agencies or law firms. They are collection agencies that do the phone calls and the letters and do whatever else they can short of pursuing any legal option. On, on these cases, on this huge number of cases, the statute was about ready to run, and so the Office of Finance had to have the cases transferred back in and then refer them to our office so that we could pick up what needed to be done legally in order to preserve the statute of limitations. And, and just to add, from a dollar perspective, uh, we filed on everything that exceeded uh, $10,000 and above. I believe the uh, staff for the Office of Finance, the collections unit, uh, filed small claims actions on the remainder, anything under $10,000. And are these primarily those that are about the, excuse me, about the time that AB 63 was implemented? Are a lot of these uh, quite a few of them. Quite a few of them are AB 63, uh, any other discovery programs that the, that the Office of Finance had with vendors. Uh, they may have come about uh, with uh, field audits. So a large number of them are, are consist of those types of cases. There are audits. There are any number of types of different cases. But yes, AB 63 uh, cons uh, comprises a great deal of them. Because I know there was some confusion, for example, on writers. And they, you know, I mean, I did. I don't know the breakdown on those 400 if there are a group of those that we ultimately tried to adjust that because it, it didn't seem like they were real businesses necessarily. So we don't really have a breakdown of the categories of who these people are. No, we do not. Um, if, they, if I recall correctly, they covered the gamut of, of the fund classes that uh, Office of Finance has. So. Well, this is um, for other collections that the Department of Finance is doing, like parking tickets, for example. Um, do, how many attorneys do you have to handle anything that the Department of Finance gives to you or any other type of uh, collections that we're doing that we would make as a city that are delinquent? Are we, doing, we, don't have, we don't. We don't handle the parking tickets in our office. Maybe I would. Anything, so the only thing the city attorney handles for the city and delinquent or money owed to the city are the business tax? Actually, the, uh, the Office of Finance is responsible for collecting all delinquent accounts throughout the city uh, that are referred, uh, except for the proprietaries and ambulance billing. So it, it, it just happened in this particular uh, case that, that the bulk of these were uh, tax cases because it had the unique problem of the uh, statute of limitations running on March 1. Uh, but the collections unit for Office of Finance handles all matters except for the proprietaries. So those never go into a legal proceeding? These are legal proceedings. No, but for the other ones, the ones uh, handled by the Department of Finance that are delinquent, 
and whatever money is owed to the city, they never go into legal proceedings, and the city attorney does not handle those? Yeah, actually, what happens is they're referred to, uh, to the director of finance. Uh, they will do whatever collection activities they believe is necessary, and then ultimately it's referred to the city attorney for filing of legal action. So that's how we get them. We're kind of the end of, of that process. So you do get some? Yes. We, yes. Okay. And, yes. and how, how big is that load? Well, in the normal course, we were averaging about five cases per month, primarily consisting of tax cases. And as it, uh, Noreen indicated, uh, we ended up with uh, the load of the 400 cases. But on average, it had been about five cases per month that was referred to us. Because they have other mechanisms in place, there's the small claims procedure that's pursued okay. by the, the investigators there's themselves. dollar amount that you would be, okay. That's correct, yes. Thank you. Now, do you have a, um, a list of the 25 million outstanding every bit? Of, we know about those different groups that, that owe us money. We, we do. Well, we have a list of all of the um, individuals or companies that we have filed against, yes. Okay. Um, and um, these were basically in 2005, if I'm reading this report right? Actually, what, the way the Office of Finance structures their collection, they normally do it in three-year periods, tax periods. So we have, uh, if we have 2005, we may also have 2006, 2007, if they were delinquent for those years as well, because of the way that the uh, Office of Finance normally would look at uh, audits and pr their procedures, they normally do things in periods of three years. So we have 2005 forward. We also have some that were prior to 2005, depending upon how the Office of Finance assess those delinquent accounts. Going forward, um, can we think of another strategy of an additional person or two to collect this kind of stuff in the routine way rather than this particular moment? I obviously like this moment. There's no cost out on us. Whatever we get is for us, which is better than losing that $25 million. But I mean, structurally speaking, we have debts every year and people don't pay bills every year. I don't want to go to outside firms for anything. I want the internal capability in our city of taking care of our responsibility. Can we learn from this going forward and work on a staffing pattern that can justify itself? Actually, we, we have learned and we've made a request um, for us to have two additional uh, attorneys assigned to the Office of Finance. We believe that with the addition of two attorneys that we would be able to handle the volume of cases referred to us for collection. And we agree with you that we would prefer to be able to do it in-house if possible. Um, as it stood right now, we just did not have the uh, resources to do that. Um, but we believe that with two additional attorneys, we would be able to do so. And then when you go through the budget process, you'll put the two up there, you'll point out what the areas would be and how they'll not only pay for themselves, but actually. Yes, pay. absolutely. Yes. Um, out of 400 cases, have any of them come forward and settled now? Actually, we have had a few who have offered right. to do that. Uh, yeah. we've, we've had any number uh, to come forward. Uh, actually, we didn't even have to file. Uh, they just heard the fact that, about the fact that we were about to, and so they called us, and we've been able to negotiate settlement uh, with them. Uh, we haven't served the cases yet, so any number of taxpayers haven't had the opportunity to come forward. They're aware of the cases. I'm not quite sure how. Uh, I guess they check the filings, but uh, they have come forward and made calls. Uh, many of those, however, are complaining that they never should have been sued. Uh, so we haven't settled a large number, but, but this process did weed out uh, any yeah. number. Well, it starts the process of figuring that out, if they were right or wrong. I'm sorry. It starts the process of figuring out whether there was a mistake or not. That's correct. Yes. Exactly. I was trying to see if we had an estimate in terms of how much money we have been able to gather just as a result of this. It's it's over uh, maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars. So a couple hundred thousand dollars um, before we've even served them, after we yeah. basically filed the complaint, but before service. Uh, I would hope if we, and it's yet to be discussed, if we bring on some staff attorneys to do this, we don't wait and do it in bulk, waiting to the end of the, of the statute of limitations, et cetera. Uh, when I own my own business, we used to send a filled out form saying, we're going to sue you, here's the paperwork, we don't hear you by a certain date. And it's amazing how many walk in the door and make some sort of a deal with this, the threat of a lawsuit. So I, I would hope we can save all a lot of money and trouble just doing it that way. But we'll talk about that in the budget, I guess. 
In fact, uh, okay. we're going to have, a, I believe, on the 23rd, a couple hours dedicated to revenue generation. So that may be a, That's a good place yeah. to deal with it. One, one thing, and this is I primarily CAO, I think this committee has asked a, a number of times over the last few years that this process of getting firms in to collect money is exactly what we should be doing, and they should be dealing with our property taxes, our transfer taxes. Uh, at a certain point, we, we have to have some ability to know how much money we should be getting versus how much we get. And I think that uh, particularly if they're working on conting uh, contingency, it's, a, it's not hard money that we're giving. They're basically earning what they recover. And so, uh, again, I know I have it on my list of things to talk about uh, when we have this financial discussion at council because it just seems like uh, it begs for us to have a bench of folks that can go out and search the books in our behalf for all the revenue that's coming in and all the bills that are owed us so that people are out uh, bringing revenue that we that we uh, are not getting. I'll, I don't know whether it, it uh, uh, marked my psyche, but I'll never re forget the $95 million that we waived for the fire department paramedics. We might be able to open a park or two with $95 million. So, I mean, it's something that's money that's laying on the table that we, we should be looking at how outside industry can get that for us. Uh, the, the other issue on, uh, on this area is I, did, I didn't ask you earlier, on, uh, what's the length of these contracts for these three firms? We would do the typical three year or did you? The three? Yes, yes three it would be the three years. The other thing, just for the CAO, we met with a, an attorney recently, uh, and I have his number in the office, uh, David Farah. Oh, yeah. He has a company that basically says when you get finished with all of this and you still can't collect the money, that's the, they don't even want to compete at this level. They just would like to get all the paperwork that can't be recovered, and they would like to work on those. And so if we have people that are saying that based on uh, their ability to go into these files and locate people, mm -hmm. then I think we should take advantage of it and find ways to, even if they buy the whole uh, box of debt, right. that they, it's, it's returned back to us in some fashion versus us just waiving it and that's the end of it. But the more that we can Ray, push the CAO into this, we can make this a summer study. <laughs> uh, but uh, we do need to get more people involved in collection and, and revenue gen, uh, identification. Because I remember one year, and I'm gonna date myself, that we just merely challenged the county on a, and, and Greg will remember this, we just merely verbally challenged them on a source of revenue, and they cut a check for 800,000 with no discussion. So your concern is how much would it have been had we gone forward and begin to research it, so. I think it, that was the. The narcotics laboratory it's trust fund, I think it was. I mean, it was amazing. Just the mention of it, they said here. And we so need to hire a couple guys named Vito with crooked nose. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I work for the city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. my, my, I'm sorry, if I could make one final point on this, and I think this is more a, a point for the Department of Finance, but I think the earlier we get the city attorney's office involved in collections, the bigger, well, the more revenue we'll get, because through collection agencies, if people are getting these notices, they kind of just put them in a drawer. Once you get a letter from the city attorney, all of a sudden, whoa, I could go to court. We are so, your crooked noses. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, if you could speak with the Department of Finance about getting the city attorney's office involved earlier in the collection process, I think it, it may make a difference. Thank you very much. we we'll move to that item. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. That's it. I remember this guy from 2001, and he's saying he wanted to bid on our My son has a request.